can all see that. Uh, for us, you can see my desktop. Yeah, seeing your screen, full screen, looks wonderful. With the cuckoo on it. Yep. Cool. So <clears throat> um, the, the topic of this uh, webinar is uh, what can we learn from the Diderik cuckoo concepts in evolutionary biology? Um, I will say a little bit about myself to explain why I'm talking about evolutionary biology. Uh, so for 20 years, I was a professor specializing in marine biology. Um, later on, I got involved in university management and um, had a technology focus of um, developing e-learning and, and things like that in, in universities. And after that, uh, I've now spent nine years in um, uh, startups in payment technology and fintech. Um, been involved with, I think, four, four startups um, and am involved still with one right now. And Jan, we are actually a company registered in the Netherlands. So we're not that far away, even though I'm in South Africa. Um, when I was doing biology, my, my areas of specialty were systematics, that is like taxonomy and uh, figuring out what, you know, what's a new species and what's, what's not and that kind of thing. Uh, phylogeny, looking at the evolution of, uh, of uh, species, and um, ecology. So those were the, the kinds of areas that I worked in in marine biology. Then after all these 10, 10, 10, 19 years now involved with technology, I decided to go back to my biology roots and I got really interested in, in birding. And so as I learn more about birds, um, I try to... Uh, present some of the things that I learn in the context of, you know, the areas of research that I was involved in as a biologist. So hence, here I am talking about evolutionary biology and using the Diederik Kuku as an example. So I think one of the things that, one of the, the core points that I want to get across in, in relation to the Diederik Kuku is, this isn't really about the Diederik Kuku, although it is, but it's about how a bird, any bird, pick a bird, and study it deeply can teach you some of the core concepts of biology and help you understand birds more broadly. So focusing in, in order to focus out and learn more. Um, that's, the, that's the general principle here. So it, when, we look, when we go out and we, we look at the natural world and most people are here because they have an interest in the natural world, probably not just birds. Um, and these are some photographs that I've taken over the last couple of years. Um, you know, just illustrating different species in different groups from, from algae at the top there uh, to um, um, uh, the great apes at the bottom. And, uh, and, you know, when we look at the world, we see all this beautiful natural history and we forget something really, really, really important that 99% of everything that ever lived is now extinct. And what we see today is a consequence of a lot of evolutionary processes that happened over millions of years long ago in the past. And so with the, with the Diederik Kuku, what I'm going to try and do is bring some of those evolutionary processes in to help us understand the life of these birds today. So the Diederik Kuku, what is it? Well, in South Africa or Southern Africa in the spring, um, you, you know it's spring when you hear the call of the Diederik cuckoo. And uh, I'm very fortunate that they visit my, my yard quite often and they happen to be, I, I think probably one of my favorite birds, certainly one of my top 10 favorite birds uh, to just watch. They have so much behavior. There's so many things you can learn from them. Um, so what is the Diederik cuckoo? Well, obviously it's a cuckoo, belongs to the cuckoo family, the cuculidae. Um, the, uh, the family that it belongs to is divided into six subfamilies, the cuculini, the old world parasitic cuckoos, uh, the phenicophenii, the malkoas and kuas, um, and in the broad sense also includes some of the, of the cuckoos like the Jacobin cuckoo and so on. Um, the central podine, uh, podini, uh, the kukuls, uh, the co uh, my god, they have names that are so hard to say. Uh, Coxazini, the American cuckoos, and the Crotophagini, the Annies, and the Neo, uh, Neomorphini, the, the New World ground cuckoos. We'll, we'll just briefly look at some of these. Um, these two groups are sometimes uh, grouped together, and, uh, 
and uh, sometimes the uh, cuculini includes the the, the phenocophene. So, who, what are these six subfamilies? Well, the cuculini, uh, the old world parasitic cuckoos. These are the ones that are the typical familiar cuckoos, at least um, outside of uh, 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 the Americas. Um, like the red chested cuckoo, another one that is a icon of uh, spring and summer in uh, Southern Africa. Uh, it has this call that's, that uh, is in Afrikaans uh, said to be Piet my Frau, which is Peter, my wife, which, you know, go figure. Uh, uh, but, you know, the, this group includes also the, the, the common cuckoo, the African cuckoo, uh, the Madagascar cuckoo that we've had uh, visiting us uh, this past summer for, 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 for several uh, uh, months. Uh, and the, uh, the Fenicofeni includes the uh, Malkoas and, uh, and Kuas. And for those of us in Southern Africa, we have the green Malkoa, which I had to borrow a picture of somebody else from, uh, uh, borrow a picture from somebody else of, because I've never managed to get a picture of it, although I've seen it a few times. Uh, it's normally way up in the tops of trees in very dense, dense forest and very difficult to photograph. Uh, then there's the central uh, Purini, the Kukuls, which of which we have several species in southern Africa, like the virtual Kukul here. Um, then there's the uh, Coxazini, the American Cuckoos, uh, the Crotophagini, the Annies, uh, typically dark, very dark birds um, found in the uh, Neotropics. <clears throat> and then the Neomorphini, the New World Ground Cuckoos, like uh, the Roadrunner from um, Bugs Bunny. So the Diederik cuckoo is an obligate brood parasite. We're going to say a bit more about brood parasites in a minute, but what it means is that it lays its eggs in the nest of other birds. It doesn't uh, um, make a nest of its own and raise its own, own chicks. So interestingly, within this family, the cuculini, there are... Um, there are some species that are obligate brood parasites and some that raise their own. And the, the ones that raise their own are actually uh, more in number than the ones that are obligate brood parasites, but still there are 59 species um, that are obligate brood parasites. So the um, Diederik cuckoo is just one of these. Now, if you look at the, um, at the phylogeny of, of this group, and don't worry about uh, reading the words on there. You don't need to do that. That's just to, to present a picture here that, you know, the, if you can see the green uh, diamond there, um, in the Cuculini sensu stricto, uh, in the strict sense, uh, the old world parasitic cuckoos, there are 52 species in 11 genera um, that are obligate brood parasites, including, of course, um, our Diederik cuckoo. In the Phenicophene, there are four species in the genus Clematur, uh, which includes cuckoos like the, the Jacobin cuckoo and, and so on, um, that, um, uh, that are obligate uh, brood parasites. But the other genera typically are not uh, uh, brood, obligate brood parasites. And then in the Neomorphini, the New World uh, ground cuckoos, there are three species um, that are obligate brood parasites. And what if you look at the um, at at the uh, cladogram that is shown on the top right there, you can see from the cladograms that those different colored diamonds are in different branches of the tree, and what that tells us is that this uh, brood parasitism has arisen three times within uh, the, the the family Cuculidae. So there are three different groups of cuckoos um, that have obligate brood parasite parasitism, and this has arisen independently uh, three different times. So the uh, leader cuckoo is in the genus Chrysococcyx, um, in the uh, Cuculini, the old world parasitic cuckoos. So yeah, so it belongs to the old world parasitic cuckoos, this, this, the subfamily Cuculini, and it belongs to the genus Chrysococcyx. Chryso means golden and coccyx means, it's an old, I think Greek word meaning cuckoo. So it comes from this golden color that, uh, that you often see on the bird when the bird is in, in the right uh, light. 
Um, there are 13 species in the genus Chrysococcyx. Uh, six of them are Af Afro-Asian and seven of them are Australian, Australia Papuan. So we will come back to this in a sec. Um, of the Afro-Asian species, we also have the Clausus uh, cuckoo, which we also get around here um, in the summer. A uh, very beautiful bird, um, very green in color. Uh, it, it, the, 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 the sort of bronzy bit is more, tends to be more coppery in color, um, and it has a very distinct posture. And of course, the African emerald cuckoo is also a chrysococcyx. Uh, another one that I've seen, but never managed to get a photograph of, so I borrowed someone else's. So uh, the species of uh, the, the leader of cuckoo is Chrysococcus caprius, and caprius also refers to that sort of coppery, bronzy color. And the common name of uh, Diederik, it's an onoma onomatopedic uh, rendition of the bird's call, the Diederik, Diederik. Uh, that you will hear um, in a second, hopefully. Let me just make sure my volume is high, if you can hear it. So hopefully you heard that, and at the end of it, you heard the Diederik, uh, the, the, the sound that gives the bird its name. And that call, that sound, is synonymous with spring in, in Southern Africa. By um, October, these birds have arrived, and they're calling all over the place. So now, given what we know about the Diederik cuckoo up to now, what kinds of questions can we ask uh, based on, on, on what we know? So maybe we can ask, when did this uh, family arrive? When did the cuculidae arise? When did their adaptive radiation into all these different species of cuckoos happen? Uh, when did Chrysococcyx split off from the other uh, 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 members of the cuculidae and undergo speciation? So that is probably one of the first things that I ask about a bird when I, um, when I want to get to know it better. So I might pick a a species of lark. If I'm interested in larks, I might pick a, piece, pick a pipit. Um, I, I might go and look at pittas, and you know, there are different birds that you can just say, okay, what can this bird teach me about the evolution of this group of birds? So that's what we're going to do first. And when I talk about adaptive radiation, I mean the rapid diversification of a single lineage into many species that inhabit a variety of environments or use a variety of resources. And they're different because different traits are required to exploit those resources or habitats. So in other words, you have a single uh, species that kind of spreads out and divides and becomes uh, uh, more species. Um, and that is known as adaptive radiation. So when did the cuculidae arise? There is a very, very limited fossil record of cuckoos. Uh, <clears throat> all the fossil record can tell us is that uh, the, the minimum uh, time when the cuculidae arose, which is about 39 million years, but we know they're older than that. And we know that they're older than that because uh, recent genetic work um, suggests that they split from other, other birds around 55 million years ago. So now knowing that and getting to the point of understanding it can also teach us a lot about the rest of the, of, uh, of the birds. Because if you look back um, at the, uh, Kate, the, 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 the um, Cretaceous tertiary extin extinction event, uh, the, K, K2, uh, the so-called K2T uh, extin extinction, um, the, uh, this is marked by the, the hitting of the earth, earth by the Chicxulub uh, asteroid which landed in the Gulf of Mexico, uh, probably not far from where uh, Faraz is. Um, and uh, it was probably one of the major reasons for the great extinction that happened at that time, uh, around 66 million years ago. And if you look at the time frame um, after that, um, in the first uh, 12 to 14 million years or so is when the birds 
all birds, all groups of birds arose from their uh, common ancestors and underwent this adaptive radiation. So the origin of the of the Kukulidae, um, which is shown here, um, is within that same time frame when all of the major groups of birds arose, with 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 uh, some small exceptions um, and and notable exceptions like the uh, this this group uh, here that includes the. Uh, um, flamingos and the uh, 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 podocyps that you get in uh, Madagascar. So the uh, so the uh, the cuckoos arose within as a group arose within this time frame of the the first twelve to fourteen million years after the great extinction event happened, and that was the time when all the birds were undergoing this uh, adaptive radiation, and and as I said, you know, if we look at the the, the uh, I'm 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 using my laser like you could see it. I use my mouse. Sorry. So if you look here at 60 million years ago, um, and you look down down here, you'll see that the um, uh, the the, the Cuculini is divided into these two uh, groups: the the Cuculini sensu stricto and the uh, Phenacophani, and these groups. Uh, these two groups split off from one another around about 40 million years ago. And you can see that now you can see why we say that this um, obligate brood parasitism has arisen twice because here it is in this group and here it is in this group, but they'd already separated at the point at which um, uh, uh, this obligate brood parasitism arose. So it arose independently in these two lineages. And then it also arose in uh, this Neomorphini lineage um, over here, which probably dates back. It's difficult to say because the scale here is not linear, but this is probably in the 30 to 35 million year, uh, sorry, in the 25 to 35 million year uh, range. So three times uh, this arose. Let's. Let's look at it on, a, on an actual time scale now, because one of the things that we, we can learn from birds as well is a little bit about the history of life on Earth. So um, the, the Neornithes have been around since before uh, the extinction event, um, but they diversified af after the, the, uh, the, the extinction event. So if we look at when the Cuculidae arose, arose, it was in the early Eocene. Um, um, around about 55 million years ago. If we look at the, the history of brood parasitism and we look back through that uh, phylogenetic uh, tree, the, the cladogram that I just showed you, um, we can put brood parasitism somewhere in this period here, probably within uh, 25, around, between, somewhere between 20 and 35 million years ago, probably during the Oligocene and um, again, during the uh, Miocene, for some of the, uh, the the groups that have that are relatively new to obligate brood parasitism, and the genus Chrysococcyx probably um, fits in at around uh, somewhere between fifteen and twenty million years ago, with the uh, with the Chrysococcyx uh, caprinus and and Klaus uh, separating sometime fairly recently within the last two or three or four million years. So that gives us a kind of a sense of the evolutionary um, history of these birds, of these cuckoos, and of the species that we are particularly interested in. So that's one way, and those are one sort of category of questions that we can ask about the, the cuckoos, about, uh, about the Diederik cuckoo and, and where it fits into the evolutionary history of the cuckoo and then when did the uh, when did Chrysococcyx itself ar arise and undergo uh, speciation? So, um, um, by speciation, I mean the evolutionary process by which biological populations evolve to become uh, distinct, uh, reproductively isolated species. Um, and they don't necessarily, even though they may be uh, reproductively isolated, don't necessarily um, have to be have to have visibly different visible differences in order to be different species. We need to keep that in mind. So there's two kinds of speciation. There's allopatric speciation, where populations become geographically isolated from each other, 
uh, to an extent that prevents or interferes with uh, gene flow. And if anybody's been looking at the classification of pipits in the last few years, for example, you'll see that there was a species that was called a long-billed pipit that occurred from, Southern Afri uh, from South Africa all the way up to East Africa. But we now know that the East African population is actually reproductively isolated from the Southern African population. We now have two species. Uh, of, of pipit, the long, uh, Eastern long bill pipit and, and Nicholson's pipit. So that's an example of allopatric speciation. Uh, sympatric speciation is when new species are established uh, from another species within, uh, within the same geographic region. And that might happen by, they, uh, by them exploiting different uh, microhabitats, uh, different food, um, or, and so on. And, and the larks are a prime example. The Southern African larks are prime examples of that, where you have um, uh, roughly around, I don't know, 20 species of larks that all seem to ha inhabit different, slightly different microhabitats. And although the, their, uh, their prey is most, almost always insects um, with some seeds, um, uh, it's the microhabitats that seems to have given them um, uh, that that, uh, that seems to have uh, helped them separate into different species. So what about the Diederik cuckoo? So you can see from this that it's the, the uh, genus Chrysococcyx is uh, split into three groups, um, the Asian and the African, which basically form one clade. And the Asian and the African uh, uh, species separated at some point. And so we have three species um, sorry, one, two, three, four species of African uh, chrysococcyx, two of Asian chrysococcyx, and then we have a bunch of species which uh, would, uh, the, the data doesn't really allow us to say very much about the differences between them, but they are certainly different from uh, and split off from the African and Asian species quite some time ago. Um, so, you know, the, 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 the figures it's difficult to put exact dates on these, um, but it gives you a sense of how the species uh, evolved. So there was probably um, a mixture of uh, allopatric speciation and sympatric speciation taking place here. Okay, so let's come back to brood parasitism. So the idea actually for this, um, for this presentation uh, came about when uh, one of my friends on Facebook said, I would love to know how the Dieter Cuckoo knows what color eggs to lay. Um, so it, it kind of stimulated me to think about how one could explain that. Um, so let's delve into brood parasitism and then let's delve in a little bit to the selective world of, of birds. And let's try to understand a little bit about uh, brood parasitism and, and, and how the coloring of the eggs evolved. So brood parasitism is a strategy in which an organism uh, relies on others to raise their young. It doesn't raise its own young. Um, it may invade the nest of, of another species and leave an egg there, uh, but it frees the parents from having to build nests, brood the eggs or rear the young, so they can, have, um, they can lay many more eggs in a breeding season. Uh, and they can basically use much of the breeding as much of the breeding season as their host species uses in order to uh, um, uh, make more young. And after all, um, all living organisms, their purpose in life is to create copies of their DNA, uh, to bear that in mind. So, so, this, so something which creates more copies of the DNA is going to be selected for. Um, it occurs in insects, fish, and birds. Um, as I said, it's evolved multiple times in, in birds in different groups, uh, in the cuckoos, in three, three different uh, groups that we just talked about. Um, but it's not only in cuckoos. In, uh, in Africa, we have uh, uh, three different groups. We have the vidudidae. Uh, uh, sorry, let me try that again. Vidudidae, um, which is the cuckoo finch, the indigo birds, and the widas. And they're all brood parasites, some of them very highly specialized. And we had a really interesting presentation about a month ago um, uh, uh, on, on this, this topic with this group. And then there are the honey guides, um, which I hope we will have a presentation on early next year. The person who I would like to do this is not available uh, this year, having just had a child. 
Um, but hopefully next year we'll hear all about the, the honey guides and of course the cucurity. So let's look at the selective world of birds and try to understand in the Diederik cuckoo what, go what goes on in terms of, uh, of this life cycle that is focused on laying its eggs and letting some other bird raise its young. So we need to think about some basic principles of, of evolutionary biology. Uh, one of them obviously being natural selection. I think everybody's heard of natural selection. So let me say a little bit about what it is. It's basically the differential survival and reproduction of individuals due to differences in, and this is critically important, genetically determined features. In other words, the phenotype. Uh, if the, if the uh, it, it, individuals can be can differ in their genes, but if those genes don't create some differences that the environment can act on, um, they can't really be uh, selected for or against. So it's differential survival of, of, uh, of the genotype because of differential survival of the phenotype. Um, so it's based on the fact that gener genetically determined variation exists in populations. Some variations um, produce phenotypes that are, that are better for survival or that enable the organism containing that particular genotype to be, uh, 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 with that particular phenotype, to be uh, able to reproduce more. And the genes that cause those variations increase in the population as a result of them offering better chances of survival or higher reproduction, rates of reproduction. So these changes are the basis of evolution by natural selection and over many, 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 many millions of years uh, produce all that diversity that we, we saw on the third slide that I showed. So what is the selective world of birds? So we talk about selection pressure as if it was, it's an analogous concept, it's an analogy. There isn't any pressure, but we talk about selection pressure because of the outcome uh, of, of the events. So it's anything that influences and it could reduce or it could increase the reproductive success of a proportion of the population. So if something reduces uh, uh, reproductive success, it will, be, it will be a negative selection pressure. Uh, if something increases uh, reproductive success, it will be a positive selection pressure. So if it's, if it's a positive selection pressure, we talk about be, something being selected for. So it's something that increases reproductive success. Um, if it's a negative selection pressure, we talk about it being it, it leading to something that is being selected against. So it's something that re reduces uh, reproductive success. Simple concepts, very, very simple concepts. So look at the selective world of, world of birds a little bit more. Um, there is a type of selection that Darwin calls uh, sexual selection. It's basically a form of natural selection, but it's a highly focused and specialized form. And it's selection brought about as a result of the relative success or failure of mating. Okay, so think about that. Success or failure of mating. If you have a characteristic that generates, that attracts more mates, you will mate more. And that characteristic will be selected for if it's got a genetic basis to it. If you're, if you're not, um, if, you're, if you have a genetic uh, character that reduces the, your success at mating, in other words, you fail at mating more, more often, that uh, genetic character is not gonna be selected for. So that's basically selection. Effect, uh, selection. And one of the common methods of selection, sexual selection is mate choice. So one biological sex chooses members of the other sex with which to mate. And it's usually the females that choose the, uh, uh, the mate in birds. Not always, but usually. And uh, com competition among members of a, of a given sex for mates can also uh, um, uh, influence uh, sexual selection. So it could be competition among males, for example, that compete for females. Uh, and this is how you end up getting uh, all kinds of interesting uh, behavior. And both forms usually occur or typically occur within any given species. So one may be stronger, uh, uh, made choice, but competition among males is never completely absent. And uh, sexual selection can produce some really bizarre uh, phenotypes. Uh, 
like this bird of paradise here. So there are external factors and there are internal factors that affect the uh, uh, evolution of birds. So these could be things like finding food, uh, avoiding predators, avoiding and, and or surviving disease, uh, avoiding and or surviving parasites, uh, finding a suitable environment in which to live, and internal factors such as the health and well-being of, of the animal, uh, as well as its reproduction. And that is finding a mate, uh, being able to successfully copulate. Um, it's no good to find a mate if you can't actually uh, get the uh, gametes across. Uh, successful egg laying. Um, it's no good to have a fertilized egg if you don't, if you if you can't lay it, uh, you know, if you can't get it in the right place and rear the young, rear the young uh, successfully. So all of these are are things that influence uh, that can be select that can um, determine uh, the the characteristics of a bird that gets selected for or selected against. Now, if you look at the world of birds, uh, sight and sound feature very strongly, and birds uh, produce characteristics that can be considered to be signals. And a signal is something which uh, an animal does, or a color that it has, or some aspect of it that sends out a signal that says something to um, another organism of the same species, or even of a different species for that matter. And these can be things like morphology, the shape, uh, characteristics of the feathers and all of those things, color, uh, calls, uh, songs, behavior. And um, so some of those signals have to do with mate choice. And uh, there are two uh, things, two competing theories or uh, hypotheses around mate choice in birds. One is that, um, uh, 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 the characters of birds that are chosen by the, the, the mate are signaling the fitness of the animal. And the other one, uh, which is that, nah, they don't just, they don't signal anything. It's just a, all about the aesthetics of the female or the aesthetics of the one making the choice, which is typically the female. And this caused an enormous amount of argument in, in the Victorian era, of course, because it was not very popular at the time that females uh, could have an aesthetic uh, that would allow them to, to make a choice that would determine how males look. Um, and that, and that um, controversy is carried through to, to today. Um, so let's look at the life cycle of the Diderik cuckoo. Now, if we've, we've looked at two uh, aspects of natural selection, sexual selection, and natural selection, pure natural selection itself. Um, if we look at the uh, Diderik cuckoo, the, the, they're dimorphic, that is the two sexes have different morphological characteristics. And if you, if you look at the evolution of those characteristics, you can see that natural selection and sexual selection have paid, played kind of competing roles or not necessarily competing roles, but different roles between the two sexes. So the males, if you look at the male on the left-hand side there, you'll see it's, it's, it's much more colorful, um, got much more colorful characteristics than the female where probably natural selection plays a bigger role. So if we, if we look at these, these two uh, things, sexual selection, uh, the, by female choice probably is what leads to things like the, the red eye of the Diderik cuckoo, which obviously makes the bird stand out. Um, it's brighter colors. It's got a very, very piercing uh, call um, that it also uses to dominate territory. So there is competition between males going on there as well. Um, sexual selections probably also influence this ritual feeding behavior that I'm going to show you in a few minutes. On the other hand, in the female, uh, the female has a duller eye and more subdued colors because natural selection probably selects for the female to be more hidden um, because if the female is easy to see, it's gonna be difficult for her to uh, invade a nest and, and lay her eggs. And uh, we'll come back to that in a, in a few minutes. So that's just a little bit of how evolution can influence differently 
um, males and females. And now we can learn this from the Diederik Cuckoo. So now let's look at the life cycle of the Diederik Cuckoo. Um, I'm going to use a couple of sets of photos uh, that I've been very fortunate enough to be able to take while observing um, Diederik Cuckoos. One of them is um, the ritual feeding behavior that I observed at Replay Nature Reserve just near Pretoria. And the other is the nest invasions that I managed to observe um, at Satara Camp in Kruger National Park. Uh, so let's have a look. So the Diederik Cuckoo, as I said, is an obligate brood parasite. Um, there are 24 species of hosts in Southern Africa, so it doesn't just parasitize one single host. It has 24 species of hosts um, that have been uh, recognized. It's most commonly uh, weavers, bishop birds, and sparrows. So the common hosts in Southern Africa are the Southern Red Bishop, um, the Cape Sparrow, uh, the Spectacled Weaver, the Lesser Mass Weaver, and the Southern Mass Weaver, and any of the other weavers as well, it will, it will, uh, um, it, it will parasitize. So I'm going to talk about in, in, uh, in my example of the nest invasion, it's a lesser mass weaver, but th keep all of these in mind because it has a very interesting implication um, on the evolution of egg color in the Diderik cuckoo. So yeah, a little bit more about the life cycle. It's an intra-African migrant that spends the winter uh, like this time of the year up in equatorial Africa. Uh, and then it moves north and south for breeding around uh, um, uh, October or so. So it arrives in Southern Africa in October. I always listen for the arrival of the Diderik cuckoo. It's usually after the 15th, around the 20th or so of October, at least where I live. <clears throat> and then the, once they arrive, they don't move around very much. They stay pretty much in the same area. Um, as I've said before, their calls are iconic and they uh, herald the onset of spring or summer. We don't have much of a spring in this part of the world. It just kind of goes from winter to summer. Um, by late April, they've left again and gone back up to equatorial Africa. Uh, the female typically establishes the territory at a colony of suitable hosts. So in my example, it's a colony of lesser mass weavers. And um, once the female establishes the territory, the males come around and, and try to get her attention and get her to mate with them. So uh, starting with the, uh, with the uh, examples from uh, Replay Nature Reserve, the males typically uh, call from a perch or they fly around the territory where the female is and they call in the air. My, it's, it's, it's difficult to um, say which one occurs more often, but my observation suggests that it's, it more often calls from, from a perch, but it is definitely the case that it flies around calling as well. Um, especially um, in late October and, and during the month of November up into early December. Um, the males will do a wing display where it raises its wings or flashes its wings open like that, uh, especially if a competing male is heard or sighted, or if it knows that there's a female nearby and it's trying to get to her attention. It kind of goes, hey, here I am. Hey, here I am. Hey, here I am. And uh, the female may become interested. So the female, uh, this female was attracted by that male's antics. Um, he got her attention and uh, she flew in and landed on a branch not too far away. And he got really excited and started flapping his wings and calling. And um, she, just the, you could see that the bird is showing a high level of, of excitement and displaying vigorously. Uh, in, the, in this male's case, he flew off and left the female on the branch. And I thought, hmm, that was kind of a weird thing to do. Then like a few seconds later or a minute later, back he comes and he's carrying this hairy caterpillar, uh, which is typical of what the Diderik cuckoos um, eat and also typical of what the males will go and catch and bring to the female. And uh, then there's this really interesting ritual behavior where when the female starts to show interest and she starts to bob and she can call back as well. Um, um, in, in a more subdued call than, than the call that the male makes. And uh, 
he then flies over next to her and shows her the caterpillar. And then there's this large amount of bobbing up and down, bobbing up and down, bobbing up and down next to each other. Like the male will be up, the female will be down. The male will go down, the female will be up. And it's, it's literally like this for, it can be up to two or three minutes. And it's a fascinating thing to watch. And at some point, the male decides, okay, I'll give you the caterpillar. So he lets the, the female take the caterpillar. And again, several seconds, they kind of holding it between them like that. And occasionally I've seen the, the female let go of it. Uh, and then the male kind of says, no, 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 take it, take it, take it. Um, and then they bob up and down again. And then the male hands it over to her or beaks it over to her. And uh, eventually she's, she's got the, cat, uh, the caterpillar. And at that point, the male might just fly off. And so what, she, what the female did in this case was she flew over into another tree I could see through the branches that she was beating the the um, uh, the, the 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 hair off the the caterpillar and then ate it. And then after about two or three minutes, she came back to the same tree again and sat there preening, and I guess hoping the male was going to bring another caterpillar. And uh, and, and and I saw the same male bring the, bring three caterpillars to this one female. And then eventually they flew off into that other tree and I lost sight of them. I didn't manage to catch whether they uh, had copulated or not, um, but I'm assuming that they did. So the next piece of the story is uh, what happens once the egg is fertilized and is developed um, inside the uh, uh, body of the female. Uh, I'm going to use uh, the uh, lesser mass weaver nest. There's um, typically in summer, in Kruger National Park, there's a lot of colonies of lesser mass weaver. And in Satara campsite, there are uh, incredible numbers of lesser mass weavers. They have colonies all over the place. And uh, one evening I came back, it, was, it, it started to rain and uh, came back to the campsite a little bit early because the light had just about gone. And, and uh, so these photos were taken almost in the dark. Um, so, you will see that the quality of the of the uh, depth of field is very limited because I had to shoot it a fifteenth of a second at, at f two point eight in order to take these pictures. So, so the first thing I noticed while walk, walking back from the toilet <laughs> after I got back to the campsite was um, the female had invaded the nest, and you can see this is the female Diderik cuckoo here. Um, and her head is inside the nest of the of the mask weaver, and the two male lesser mask weavers here are, are, are clinging on and pulling with all their might, flapping their wings and pulling. And eventually, in this instance, they pulled the the female out of the nest, and she went up in a tree, and she just kind of hung out in the shadows. And because she's slightly cryptic in coloration as compared to the male. Um, I think the mask weavers didn't see that she was still there and ignored her and went back about their, their, their business. Now, one other thing about this is, that is interesting is that in a lot of cuckoos, the male and the female will team up in order to invade the nest. Uh, sometimes the, the, the male will, will chase off uh, the owners of the nest or will do things to distract them so that the female can get into the nest. In the Diderik cuckoo, in all the instances that I've seen, it seems as though uh, the male plays no role at all in the nest invasion. So yeah, you can see here, they, they managed to pull the, uh, uh, the female out of the nest and she went off and, and got up, stayed up in a tree. After a couple minutes, the, uh, the weavers went back to their late evening, late early evening feeding just before it was getting dark. And um, the female again invaded another nest in a different tree. Uh, and you can see the female well inside the nest here. And you can see that the, the cloaca of the female is probably also inside the nest here. She's curved around uh, almost, uh, or maybe it's here, you can see it better. Um, and uh, she's depositing an egg in that nest. And for, at first, uh, the, the, the weavers didn't see the female. Then suddenly they saw her. Uh, along comes one. 
uh, I think that's a female, um, and and grabs hold of the the back of the of the Diderik cuckoo and tries to pull it out. But the Diderik cuckoo is having none of that. She's going to do her business, and as soon as she's done her business, she grabs the egg of the uh, uh, of the uh, mass weaver, and you can see it falling there where the red arrow is, and it smashes on the ground as you can see on the left, and then she flies off. She's she's done her business now in the nest of this uh, little uh, lesser mast weaver is an egg of a Diderik cuckoo and the Diderik cuckoo's egg is white because the lesser mast weaver's egg is white. And then, of course, eventually the egg hatches. I've never managed to catch this, uh, but uh, Anya Denker from Namibia kindly let me use one of her pictures in this. Uh, Presentation. So the, uh, the 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 young cuckoo is then fed by the by the mass weaver. So how does the Diderik cuckoo know what color egg to lay? How does it know how to match its egg color to that of its host? It doesn't, um, and that's why I told you about natural selection. So we're going to come back to natural selection. So imagine I've got two birds here: uh, the greater origami cuckoo and the green egged Hamburg. Um, and imagine that the uh, greater origami cuckoo has a single egg to lay and the green egg Hamburg has a clutch of four. So the cuckoo invades the nest of the green egg Hamburg and it lays one of its strangely red eggs, discarding one of the green eggs of the green egg Hamburg. What happens to green egg Hamburg uh, says, well, that can't be my egg. They don't all do it, but enough of them do it uh, that uh, having a red egg and a green egged nest is selected against by natural selection because of the egg being recognized by the host and discarded. So what happens, very few of the red eggs hatch, but somewhere in the population of greater origami cuckoos is one that has the genes for laying an egg that is slightly green instead of red. And so that bird lays its egg in the nest of the green egg in Hamburg, and it's not recognized as often as the red egg was. And so more of the greenish eggs survive, and then eventually have more green eggs in the population and there arises a, a mutation that leads to one of the eggs being greener. And so that egg then is more like the egg of the green egg Hamburg. And so when those eggs hatch, um, the frequency of, of hatch, hatches approaches 100%. And so eventually the, the red eggs disappear from the population and the green eggs match, uh, match the, the, uh, the color of the eggs of the host. Okay, so now let's come back to the Diderik cuckoo. It's not quite that simple, but the principle that I've just illustrated um, is still how it works. But with the Diderik cuckoo, it seems to know what color egg to lay for different hosts. So how does it do that? How do I know, oh, I'm gonna go lay, I've, I've gotta make an egg. I need to color that egg for this bird that I'm gonna go and lay the egg. It was this I'm gonna go and lay the egg in. How did it know that? Well, it doesn't actually, but it does manage to match the, the egg color. So if you look at the, uh, the Diderik cuckoo eggs that are laid in the, in the nest of the spectacled weaver, they're very similar in color to the uh, eggs of the spectacled weaver. And if you look at the Southern uh, red bishop, which is bluish colored eggs, the Diderik cuckoo lays blue eggs. If you look at the Cape Sparrow, it's got these very brown and blotchy colored eggs. And guess what? The D Diderik cuckoo that lay in their nest, um, lay brown splotchy eggs. And with a lesser mass weaver, the eggs white and the Diderik cuckoo lays white eggs. How is this possible? Well, so it's not quite that simple. We need to keep that natural selection example in mind, but we need to look at something else. We need to look at how sex is determined in birds. How do birds determine whether they're gonna be male or female? Well, <clears throat> in humans, we all know you know, we have the XY chromosome system, uh, which determine where our sex is determined. And we share this XY chromosome system with uh, many other mammals and, and, and even other organisms. So females 
have two of the same kind of chromosome, the XX chromosome. So they're the so females are the homogametic sex, and males have two different kinds of chromosome, the XY chromosome. So males are the heterogametic sex. Now, how does this? What is what happens in birds? Well, birds use different chromosomes for sex determination. So we call it um, the ZW instead of the XY. Uh, sex determination system just because it's a, it's a different chromosome, a different chromosome pair. So the males, have, instead of the females being homogametic, uh, the males are homogametic. So they have two of the same kind of chromosome, the ZZ uh, chromosome. Uh, the, the pair is both, uh, the chromosome pair are both Zs. Um, and the females are the heterogametic sex, and they have two different chromosomes, the Z and the W chromosome. Uh, these are obviously, they don't have Zs and Ws written on the chromosomes. These are just uh, terms that we use to identify um, uh, different, uh, different chromosomes and different um, approaches to sex determination. So in the male Dieterich cuckoo, you're going to have two Z chromosomes. And in the female, you're going to have Z and the W. And the W chromosome is typically smaller than the Z, than the Z chromosome, but it does still carry quite a lot of genes. And a lot of genetic information that relates to femaleness is carried on that W chromosome. So what this means is that essentially any genes that are on the W chromosome can evolve independently in the female from the male, because the males doesn't have the W chromosome and doesn't contribute, the, the sperm doesn't contribute any, anything to the, to the W uh, chromosome. So these different genetic lines are called, uh, it's called the gens, one, one, one genetic line is called the gens and the plural is gens. Um, so a host specific lineage of a brood parasite species, it's actually derived from, the, from a Roman uh, term, um, but it, it literally just means uh, it's a lineage within a brood parasite that is determined by a particular gene uh, that is contained on that W chromosome. So each gens has adapted uh, to parasitize a particular host. So th these different gens within the female lineage have evolved independently as if they were different species. So natural selections happen exactly as we described with the, with the, uh, uh, with the two birds with the red and the green eggs, uh, but each gens evolves separately from the other. Um, and the genes for that are carried on the W chromosome. So the females, only the females are, accept, are affected. And so any gene on the W chromosome is only passed from the, from the mother to daughter. The males are not affected by it. So the females is effectively are evolving into slightly different uh, lineages independently of the males because of this uh, W chromosome and the carrying of the genes on the W chromosome. So the particular specialization is passed on from the mother to daughters by the W chromosome. Uh, so if we look at the spectacled weaver, you will see that the, uh, there is a gens of female uh, Diederik cuckoo that has the genetic makeup to lay eggs that match the um, spectacled weaver and the behavior that says, I'm going to find a spectacled weaver nest to lay my eggs in. Uh, and, and, and this is controlled by a gene located on the W chromosome. The um, females that lay their eggs in the Southern uh, Red Bishop nest are gonna be a Southern Red Bishop gens. They have the genes that say, I'm gonna look for a, a Southern Red Bishop nest to lay my eggs in, and my eggs are gonna be blue. Then <clears throat> there is the lesser mask weaver with the white eggs and a lesser mask weaver gens, same thing, Cape Sparrow with the brown blotchy eggs and there is a Cape Sparrow weaver gens and so on for all of the species um, that the, uh, 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 that the um, Diederich cuckoo parasitizes. So then why is it that they don't become separate species over time? Um, and the answer is, uh, because the males mate with any of them. And so the males uh, basically carry the, 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 uh, the genetic information for the rest of the genes of the species that uh, uh, 
you know, is exchanged with males of all, uh, with females of all the different gents. And by doing that, um, the uh, uh, integrity of the species is maintained. So the males basically breed across all the gens, and that helps to maintain the integrity of the species. So this is um, a little story about the Diederik cuckoo and how you can use a bird to learn biology so that you can learn more about the birds and understand them better. So that when you're out in the field and you're studying the birds, you're looking at them, you're watching their behavior, you have an understanding of what's going on and where it came to, came from. And you can do this exact same exercise with any species of bird. You can, you can pick any species of bird. I can look out my window, maybe I see, I don't know, I, I see some bishop birds, or I can do that with a bishop bird. Maybe if I look out my window and I see the Cape um, uh, Robin Chat, I can look at the Cape Robin Chat and I can say, okay, let's learn as much about it uh, as we can. Let's learn about where it came from, its evolutionary ancestry. What are these behaviors? Where do they come from? How does it behave in this way? What are the genetics behind it? And all of that can help you understand the birds and significantly improve the quality of your birding experience, which I think is what all birders want to do. They want to have a high quality birder, birding um, experience. And so that's my little story uh, of the Diederik cuckoo. I think we can stop uh, now and take some questions. Oh yeah, um, that was fantastic. I just want to say thank you first of all for that. Um, that was blowing my mind there. And then the rain came and uh, it came really hard. So I just missed the very last um, part of your presentation. But yeah, um, excellent, excellent. Um, what I was wondering, I just going to ask a question before anyone else um, floods you with questions. Um, is it is it that the each female each individual female will have that particular species that she would um, parasitize for her life and she'd be loyal to that particular species yes not only every individual female but all of her daughters and their and her granddaughters and mm -hmm. her great granddaughters until there comes a point at which there is a mutation where one of them uh, uh, parasitizes the different species and starts to create a gens that um, is specific to that species. And then natural selection takes over at that point. Uh, and, and so a, a new lineage can, can evolve quite quickly, but not oh. a new species. Now, if you, yeah. look, if you, if, if you go back to, the, to some of the, uh, the vigidity, uh, vigidity, sorry, I keep calling vigidity. Um, they, um, many of them um, don't have this, uh, this, this uh, um, uh, separation of a gens. They don't evolve that way. So what happens is you get natural selection creating different species very quickly. So if you look at the, uh, uh, the Judy, for example, a lot of the things like the, um, uh, um, what are they called? The, the, the little blackbirds. <laughs> um, you know, they evolve, they evolve into, into different species and each species specializes on a specific host. And it's at the species level as opposed to at the gens level because they have a different, uh, slightly different yeah. genetics where it's not uh, determined by the, uh, by the W chromosome. So it's, it's an interesting how uh, the genetics, indigo birds, thank you. Indigo birds, uh, yeah, Marion is now saying that, yeah. Yeah, I, I oh. plead age, you know. Uh, <laughs> Ridiculous. Jan is asking uh, if the female selects the correct species to lay her eggs if, because she grew up with that species. So I think it's very difficult to say what the actual trigger is, um, but it's probably a combination of genetic and learned characteristics. So I would, I would imagine that a bird that has grown up with a lesser mass weaver is more likely to parasitize a lesser mass weaver, but there's also a genetic basis to that behavior. It's not just purely a learned behavior. Uh, uh, there may be a genetic basis to how the behavior is learned, for example. You know, but yeah. there is a, there is a, it is, it is selected. Of course. 
Um, I saw someone had their hand raised. I think it's Shailish. But um, you can always put your question in the chat if um, if 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 it left you. Um, just check in the chat again if uh, I have a question here. How does a parasitic bird know that the host will feed its young the right food? So that's an interesting question, and I I, I didn't uh, uh, cover that in this in the presentation because it's a. It's, uh, it's actually a, a whole presentation on its own and there's not a lot of uh, published literature on it. But there was a, 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 a woman who did a, a master's, I think it was a master's, on um, Dieter Cuckoo's uh, laying eggs in the nest of um, weavers. And we, uh, um, I think it was a uh, village weaver, if I remember correctly, it doesn't matter which weaver it was, egg weaver. And the bishop birds, which is their more common host. So um, uh, pr probably close to half of all the Dieter cuckoos will be parasitizing bishop birds. So it's, it's a very high percentage of, I don't know if it's half, but it's a, it's a very high percentage of the, of the Dieter cuckoos parasitize uh, uh, bishop birds. Now bishop birds tend to feed almost exclusively on seeds, but the weavers take some insects. When they, when they feed their young, they often bring a mixture of seeds and insects. The bishop birds typically don't do that. Uh, the consequence of that is that the young birds, the young, uh, the young cuckoos grow slower um, in the bishop birds when they're, when, they're, when they're being raised in the bishop bird nest than they do when they're being raised in a weaver nest. But the, 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 the weaver, the weavers are better at getting the Diederik cuckoo female out of the nest and better at recognizing the eggs of the Diederik cuckoo compared to the bishop birds. So we have two competing kinds of selection going on here. We have, I mean, we have natural selection in relation to two characters, right? Obviously it would be better from a feeding perspective if they all laid their eggs in the weaver nest but fewer of those young are going to survive because uh, of the eggs are gonna survive um, because the weavers are better at, um, at throwing eggs out of the nest than the bishop birds. Um, so there is a, there's some kind of a balance, but how do they know? I think if the, if the food was completely terrible, then the behavior of laying the eggs in that uh, bird's nest, in that host's nest would be selected against. So it's not that they have an intellectual knowing it's about the genes knowing. It's about the genes having been influenced by the rate of survival. So it will be, so laying your eggs where the combination of poor food and lower survival will be selected against, right? Mm -hmm. so, so in the bishop, in the case of the bishops, uh, uh, bishop birds, they have a, um, they have a, a higher survival, but slower growth. So their, their overall fitness, but their overall average fitness probably increased, or at least stays sufficiently high that it's not selected against. The, the, the balance with the, with the weavers is the other way around. So they, um, they gain from the food quality, better quality food, but they lose uh, because uh, fewer young survive. But they balance each other out somehow, and uh, and so the so the propensity to lay their eggs in 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 the nest of one or the other st stays in the population. But there's no knowledge involved. It's purely it's purely a genetic uh, selection. That's all. Yeah, it's genetic knowledge then. Yeah, it's genetic knowledge. I see. I see. Um... Can you please suggest a resource for a layperson to understand clades and matters related to clades? Sure, I haven't really given that any thought. Um, as a biologist, something I did many, 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 many years ago. Um, so maybe this is something I need to make a blog post on at some point and put it on Learn the Birds. But uh, for now, I don't, I, it's, as a biologist, it's just something you know, you know. Cool. Um, I'm, seeing, I'm seeing some comments uh, from Judith and Harriet. In Uganda, they parasitize on yellow white eyes 
and some sun boots, including variable sun boots. And in Kenya, they parasitize gray capped social weavers and Cape Robin chat. Yes, yes, those are among the 24, I think, species that are that are listed, or at least. Um, so, um, you know, there is many, many PhDs to be had on this species, I think. Mm -hmm. We don't know much about what goes on, in, especially, you know, I mean, there could be emerging clades. Yeah, oh, sorry, emerging gens um, of uh, uh, of Dieter cuckoo that are starting to get, uh, you know, parasitize other species. Um, it would be a really interesting thing to study, but uh, it's not an easy thing to study either, that's for sure. I'm sure. Um, beside, beside the egg color, does the host know that egg size is different from the one of the cuckoo? So, um, yeah, so within the cuckoos more broadly, egg size does seem to make a difference, but it doesn't make a difference with every species, with every host species. So as I, as I mentioned, the, um, some of the weavers are better at recognizing cuckoo eggs than, uh, than the bishop birds. Um, uh, but the data on that, so, you know, the, the, it, it's such a difficult thing to study, um, that the data is just not there. You know. mm, yeah. So one could speculate, but um, they, yeah. we just don't. don't I, I think you know, there's just so much more data that we need on this stuff. Okay. Um, Nicholas wants to know what is the address of your blog. I would just say it's onlearnthebirds.com. Um, yeah, the, on learn the birds, uh, there is um, yeah. at the top of the page, I think. It's, uh, and at the bottom of the page, when you go to learn the birds, there's, uh, I'm just trying to, <laughs> the, actually the, uh, the, the, the part of the Diederik Cuckoo story is there as a blog post as well. Um, mm -hmm. And yeah, that if you scroll is, down to yeah. the bottom of the page, right down to the bottom of the page, the, the, the latest blog posts are there. We've kind of neglected the blog lately. We haven't uh, put much there. Yeah, that's in relation to the um, the question on clades. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. So if I if I do remember to get round to it, and Faraz will remind me, I'll try to put something up there. Yeah. I, I presume you're talking about cladograms as opposed to, um, yeah, I, I, as opposed to the gens, right? I'm um, I'm not sure, Nicholas. You can uh, clarify that. Yes, the answer is yes. Yeah, okay. I'll see what I can do over the next couple of weeks and put something up there. Great, great, great. Yeah, I'm just looking for, okay, there we go, I got it. I'm just going to post the, the link to the Diedrich Cuckoo blog, um, the blog post. So I'm just gonna put that in the chat if anyone wants to check the blog post on, um, on the DJ cuckoo, with inclusive of the the mating rituals that we spoke about, that Derek spoke about. So yeah, um, I think I covered all of the the questions. I'm sorry if I missed anyone, but I think that it's a lot of information and a lot of well received information at that. So yeah, I'd like to thank you, Derek, and thank everyone for coming. This was a fantastic presentation. Uh, thanks yeah. for us and thanks everybody for coming and uh, and uh, hopefully uh, it's given you some ideas to uh, you know of how to increase the, the, the quality of your birding and uh, learn more about the birds. Take care everyone. Of course. Bye bye. Take care. Have a good one. Cheers.